I am Glaucia Rosas, co-founder and director at the Duteca Alliance. In this series of interviews, I am talking with key figures on the international edutech scene to get their perspectives on how schools can really get themselves on track with their education technology. Hi, everyone. Today, I have the honor to interview John Micton. John is currently the head of education and media technology and deputy principal at the International School of Luxembourg. John is a trainer at the Principal Training Center, facilitating courses on, on technology and online blended learning as well. And in, he's a certified Google trainer, Apple Distinguished Educator and trainer at the Institut de Formation de l'Education Nationale de Luxembourg. So, hi John, thank you so much for being here and share your ideas and your experiences with us. Thank you, it's such a privilege and honor to be on this podcast. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Glacia. So John, you have been working in education technology leadership for almost 30 years now. So based on your experience, can you share with us how do you believe schools can create an intentional culture of innovation and learning uh, with shared goals that engage the community and motivate the leaders, educators, and all the stakeholders to plan and actually lead change? So that's a really good question. And if I had the magic answer, I think we would all be very wealthy. So no, <laughs> uh, I think one of the things is that it has to be purposeful and authentic and that you as school leaders, as schools, you need to kind of construct the why. Why are we engaging with digital literacy, digital fluency? Why is information technology important? And I think that's the challenge sometimes is that we don't spend the time to really define that why mm -hmm. and construct around the why then the purpose and how we want to move forward. I think so often one of the challenges schools face, we have many things that are a priority. There's assessment, there's curriculum, Currently with the pandemic, there are all kinds of new things that have become really priorities. And how do you juggle that? And how do you decide what is a priority and what is not? I think is so much the challenge. And I think for many leaders around us, we know that the digital world is seamless and it's nonstop and it's here and it's not gonna go. But how do we then transfer that understanding in a way that people, in other words, the students, the parents and the teachers can intrinsically connect to that so they can make a connection and see the value of engaging with that. So I think, you know, really for educators and leaders, it's first of all, giving yourself the permission to sit and understand what is the why? Why do you want technology to be part of your learning pathway, part of your curriculum? And once you define that, then I think it makes it much easier than to decide on the how, when, what, and where. So I think that's the challenge. And how do you do that is maybe getting uh, you know, people from different perspectives. So opening up a conversation with your community, getting student voice. So often we have these conversations without student voice. And so often students have a perspective and uh, a view on this that's very different from adults. We tend as adults to focus on our past. We use the past as our point of reference to build the future. And I know that often people say, if you focus on the past, it's going to get in the way of your future. And how do you come to terms with that idea of, let's not look at the past, let's look at the current moment with a blank slate without coming in with any perceptions or ideas and really build something from scratch. And I think that's really challenging, especially when you are a leader and you're dealing with discipline, you're dealing with COVID, you're dealing with parents, assessment, curriculum, building issues. It is very challenging to find that time. And I think is how do you make that time purposeful? How do you give yourself explicit permission to say, okay, we are really going to focus on this. We're going to carve time. We're going to make it meaningful. We're going to make it uh, based on something that we believe in. All schools have missions. They have set of values and learning principles. If one can leverage that, that makes it so much 
uh, easier because that's already something that you believe in as a school. And I think then uh, taking that mission, the values, the learning principles that you have as a school and seeing where are the connection points with digital fluency and digital learning. So I think the challenge is time. The yeah. challenge is being able to come up with a, a why that is meaningful and purposeful and connected to your mission and your values. And it's very easy for me to say it. It's much harder to do it when people are pulling you in a million different directions. That is true. So always make sure you set some time and make it purposeful, like make sure this is, uh, you know, the, the organization wants that. And uh, well, actually, I uh, from what our work with schools, we see that this is something obviously we need the input of students, of, of uh, the whole community. But once you decide, uh, we figure that once you decide on your on your vision with the community, the strategy it has to be led by the head of school, the school leadership, for sure. It has to be uh, like that to make sure it, it actually happens. I so agree with you. And I think that's the challenge. Sometimes leaders tend to, because they're so busy, they say, well, we'll let the IT department or we'll let, you know, uh, the, the, the head of education technology. But really it's about a school leader. You're the vision, you're the, the moral compass, you're the pedagogic compass of where the school's going that you've constructed through a strategic plan, through your values and aspirations. And I agree with you. It really has to come from the top. And that is so important because that's a very powerful message. If yeah. the leadership, the senior management or whatever title that group of people at the top have is that they're saying this is important. The, the kind of creative tension that we have is the world is moving at such an accelerated pace and the rate of change with ambiguity and uncertainty is accelerating. And in that, embedded in that is of course, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. digital fluency, social media, all these different aspects of digital life that have become so embedded. And with them come a lot of ethical and uh, value propositions that I think sometimes we feel that we're a bit disconnected. You know, the, the pace of change is so fast with technology, but the capacity for humans or us in general to keep up, often there's that gap. And that gap is what makes that feeling of feeling disconnected or feeling disenfranchised. And how can we translate that into a way where people don't feel sidelined, they feel like they have some ownership and they have some opportunities to engage with that conversation. And I think that's the challenge for leaders is how do you curate and choreograph that in a way that you're also not forgetting all the other things that you yeah, have to do. Exactly. The day has 24 hours for everyone, we say, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. That's so true. And that feels really hard sometimes to make that a priority. And you and I very likely, if we were in the room, we would be like, this is critical. Yes. And then you have your curriculum person, hold on, student <laughs> voice and assessment is critical. And then you have your CEO that's saying the building is critical. So you have all, all these different groups of people vying for the attention. And how do you curate it in a way that everybody feels that they have a voice, they have some ownership, there's some space for them to be heard, and that you do it in a way that everybody feels encompassed. And that's really hard to choreograph. No, for sure. Um, well, on that um, urgency and vision topic, so o o over uh, this time where most of the schools had remote learning, um, you know, we, we had remote learning, so but now students are back in school in most schools across the globe. And I get a feeling that some school leaders are still uncertain where they want to go with technology. So uh, and they do, as you mentioned, they have to set this vision, have set some time, but everything is so urgent. What is your recommendation to those school leaders to help them tackle this post COVID challenge of identifying what's role will technology play in the after, you know, the, the post-COVID? 
Yeah, that's, a, you know, I think what you're bringing up is, is an important question in the sense that we went through remote learning. Many schools pivoted in a week or days. Mm -hmm. What we, I think generally many schools learned a lot from remote learning. They learned A, that they didn't have really a distance learning plan mm -hmm. and they came up with one. And as it was a bit of like building the plane while you're flying it. And I think as time went, we, uh, many schools realized that having feedback loops with students, parents, and teachers really gave them the ammunition to better understand how to curate, tweak, and change and adapt. We quickly learned that just copying the classroom and bringing it online did not work. Mm -hmm. We realized that online takes much more time than we anticipated, mm -hmm. that that whole community, that uh, social emotional component was much more important than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And having those community Zoom meetings, those check-ins and building capacity, the idea of wellness and balance came up. So all these different things have come up. And I think one way to move forward is to take stock and say, these are the things that we've learned. These are the patterns that we've seen how can we take the things that really resonated and that we feel really worked well? And what are the things that we're going to keep? What are the things are we going to stop doing? And what are the things that we might start doing? And really giving yourself permission to kind of look back and, and reflect upon your own experience and look at how other people experience things. Because I think so much can be learned from the feedback and the experience. And again, as we said before, this time issue, you know, how do you leverage time? One thing we understand is that these tools, I'm just going to use, for example, many schools had parent-teacher conferences. Mm -hmm. And one of the things parents used to physically come to campus. What we've realized is actually we have a much higher engagement with virtual three-way conferences with a student and parents. Because parents can be in two different offices, the child can be home at school and we can all meet. And there's not that uncomfortable waiting in a chair while somebody's in there and you're embarrassed because whatever it might be, because, you know, whatever it might be, you prefer not being anonymous and that virtual learning environment. So that is something that maybe we want to keep. Mm -hmm. We know now we have new efficiencies and there's some cost savings. There's also the capacity for teachers to, from doing it at home. There are a lot of logistic issues that allows greater input from the parents. So that might be one example of something that we want to keep. I think the other thing is faculty meetings. You know, we have so many meetings where we have to get into a room. Maybe now there are moments where we don't have these meetings and we get in a room and we just have little short virtual meetings and then supported with more a hybrid and face-to-face. So I think it's looking at the things that worked, the things that we engaged with that we hadn't before and have seen a silver lining from that. I think those things are really the, the opportunities that you can then use to build your own understanding of how to move forward. But one thing is for sure is we learned a lot. There are many things that we've learned we should stop doing, many things we should keep doing. I think the one thing that really came out is this idea of well-being and balance. And we assumed we had it. The other thing that I know many teachers that I've talked to is this idea that we think kids are self-organized and have the capacity to organize their time and kind of work on their own independently. And I think what we realized and talking to some teachers is that we anticipated they had those skills, those problem solving mm -hmm. group skills. But when we went into an online environment, a lot of kids found it difficult to self-manage. And maybe that's something that we need to start doing much more, that kind of organizational skills, time management skills. Mm -hmm. So I think really having the exercise of stop, keep, start, and really taking the data that you have, I think at any time that you have data, be it feedback through surveys, maybe informal conversations, reaching out to other schools, is bringing min many different data points together. So that kind of guides you in how you might want to move forward. That, yes, uh, I'll, I'll stick to one point that you mentioned, the fact that students were you know, we anticipated that they were going to be more organized and be able to manage better their time. Um, also, during this remote learning time, teachers were able to explore new tools, 
uh, and, and, ad and adopt in their lessons. But many lessons had different, you know, the teach if, when all the teachers are trying new things, the experience for the, the students, uh, it's, it's different every lesson they go to. And maybe they get uh, disorganized because they're always trying to, or always having to climb this curve, this learning curve for every tool that the teacher has selected to their, to their lesson. So one of the issues that we have seen is that there is uh, inconsistency uh, when it comes to the use of technology. Um, how, how do you think we can tackle this issue? What's really interesting, in 1996, a gentleman, Professor Michael Moore from the University of Pennsylvania did a, quite an interesting study called transactional distance theory. And what his research was, when you are not physically in a room and you have a computer in between the teacher and the student, there's a transaction that occurs. And with that transaction, there is a distance. And in that distance, you lose some capacity of attention and engagement. And what he came up with were three components. One is this idea of dialogue and communication was one of the components that you need to have. The second was structure. So having clear structures, clear, transparent, learning objectives and goals and a common structure. So if I am in a school and I'm in an LMS, homework folder should be yellow for everybody because yep. then the kid knows yellow folder means homework. If I'm in math and I'm physics and I'm TOK, wherever I'm. So that consistency of architecture where through color codes and that structure, I know it's not creative and it's very vanilla, but that's an easy point of reference. And then the last one is a student autonomy and voice where you have feedback and where feedback is not feedback is thinking what happened in the past, but feed forward. So when you are talking to your students, you're asking them, what could I do better? Then you engage with those suggestions moving forward more than reflecting what was good in the last lesson that didn't work for you. We want to know what's not working for you now so we can move forward. So this transactional distance theory really talked about having dialogue and interaction a structure, and you mentioned that, I think, really nicely, how kids have different experiences and it's not vanilla. In other words, you might be with one teacher and have a very positive online experience because they have dialogue structure and a learner autonomy, but the other one might focus only on dialogue and not have the structure and the learner autonomy and the child might get lost. So I think having some consistency and understanding that those three components, it's one theory, there are many different theories, but transactional distance theory, I think really holds true because it really addresses some of the things that you've just raised is the idea of having consistency. Because the last thing you want to do is for a student or teacher to go into an ecosystem and spend their time trying to work out where things are. Because exactly. as soon as they're trying to work things out, you've lost them. But if they go in and they know the pink folder is the videos, the yellow folder is homework, assessment, uh, resources, and there's a color code and it's consistent, they know when they go in there, they say, okay, I need to check my homework. Oh, I'm gonna go to the assessment folder. Oh, there's a feedback folder. And really work within that structure and give them the opportunity for dialogue. So you're available, you're online. And then also the idea that they also have a voice. So when they give input and feedback that's taken and used to improve the situation. Exactly. Also, a little structure can't hurt anyone, right? No. <laughs> if it's consistent, and I think yeah. it's meaningful because what you want to do is for kids to focus on the learning and not navigating the ecosystems that you've built. Yep. Exactly. And well, with this increased use of technology, uh, schools obviously produce a massive amount of data. And, you know, the GDPR and the, the data protection regulation are different in every country, but they were already, schools were always already worried about that. But now I think it came to their attention very heavily because they noticed the amount of 
the amount of data they are producing and also certain uh, issues that could happen, uh, cyber crime and stuff like that. So I know that the International School of Luxembourg updated its uh, data security strategy in 2018 uh, with the coming uh, law of the, the GDPR. And there are many schools on the same path too at the moment. So could you share again <laughs> how this school went about this change and how you contributed to that? Yeah, so the General Data Protection Regulation is a law that's in the EU, but can impact any EU citizen outside of the EU. It has to do with personal data. So that could be your voice, your image, any information that potentially could identify you. And the agreement is that at any time, I have the right as an EU citizen to know where my data is being kept, and, and I could ask for subject access request where I could ask an organization, <coughs> excuse me, to tell me where my data is, how it's being used, how long it will be there, and how it might be deleted. So of course, what happened was that for many schools, we were mindful of personal data, but maybe not at the level that the GDPR required. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did is we did an audit of our processes. So we said, let's find out all the different processes we have, be it in our student information system, be it pieces of paper that I put in my shelf that have grades or reports uh, on students, maybe their handwritten reports or whatever it might be. And we basically uh, used a consulting company out of the UK, and they helped us map our processes. So what we needed to know is when we take a piece of information that has personal data, what happens to it, who has access, where is it stored, how long is it stored. And this has been an ongoing process that we're engaging to this day. It has been very challenging because I think generally we don't think of being that mindful of that, not because we're doing anything with the data, but we're just very comfortable sending maybe an attachment through email with some medical data to the school nurse. Well, that might not be a good idea because what happens if that email gets forwarded? So all these different aspects came into play. And I think it's been very challenging for schools on top of everything we've been talking about time and full plates is to engage with that. So what we did is we created a steering committee. Mm -hmm. We worked with a consultancy organization. We did a lot of professional development. So we talked to our teachers. We created also a process. So when teachers want to adopt an extension or an app, there's a process that they follow that then we map and look for compliance and then if it's compliant then we adopt it so a lot of it has to do with finding the time educating people giving the opportunity for people to have the time to digest and understand this and then create structures and processes and accountabilities that make it easier i think one thing that there maybe is a misconception is because of gdpr we can't do a lot of things I think it's more because of GDPR, we have to be much more mindful the way we use personal information, be it in, on social media, within the context of our school or outside of our school. So I think it's quite challenging. One of the things that's been wonderful, there have been different organic groups of uh, educators and schools coming together, supporting each other via conferences, and there is a GDPR group in Europe that has a Google uh, discussion board. There are many different opportunities to really reach out to people, and people have been extremely helpful. We since then now have a data protection officer who is responsible for ensuring that we're compliant and also acts as an advisor. And so my role was at the beginning is really helping with this whole mapping process, highlighting the, uh, the importance of it, educating the leadership team and using the digital learning coaches and other people in the community of our school to really understand this and support our teachers to understand how to navigate this. It's been uh, challenging, you know, GDPR people roll their eyes, mm -hmm. but it's something that we have to grapple with. The reality is it's actually a very good thing because so many of us don't know what's happening with our personal information. Mm -hmm. And as you can see in the press, 
or with Facebook and other social media companies, that's always a topic that generates a lot of emotion. And I think the GDPR is basically saying, if you're going to hold personal data on somebody, you need to be transparent in what you're doing with it, how you use it, and how they can get it. Yes, which is, which is great. I mean, the, the, some things like that, like as you mentioned, Facebook and social media, they're all new things for us. So uh, obviously decades to decades. So we need to find ways to live with these new technologies. And, and that I think data protection is there to help us, not uh, block us from, <laughs> from, yeah. from anything. That's I think the one thing that we noticed is that first everybody thought it was an IT problem, but actually yeah. IT is only one of the a third. The other third is governance. So what are the policies and procedures you have a school? So like your admissions, when somebody sends a, uh, the, the, their report cards, their medical records, their pictures, what is the process that you do to guarantee that that's secure? And what is the process if that person wants to know how you're using the information that you're transparent? So I think quickly we realized as schools, it's not an IT issue, it's actually a governance issue. How do we engage with the policies and procedures where personal data is being used, transferred, uh, passed along, used as data points? So I think that's been a, a you know kind of a, a learning curve for many schools ours included definitely well i think those uh those recommendations are golden for many schools who are sometimes even scared of the process uh so that was i think it was very helpful along with everything else that you shared so i would like to thank you so much for helping us uh, to share, spread best practices and share your experiences. It was really great talking to you, John. Thank you, thank you very much. Likewise, thank you so much. Always such a pleasure to connect with you and uh, thanks again for having me on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Great.